Today we're going to be looking at Luke 15, verses 11 through 32. Now, just so you know, we're not going to make it all the way through. We're not going to make it all the way through, but this is the parable of the prodigal son. Luke 15, verses 11 through 32. I'm going to read all of it, but like I said, we're not going to make it all the way through today. So Luke 15, verse 11. And he said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had, took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Making our way through the prodigal son, but we are not going to finish it today. But before we move forward, let us back up and talk about what we went through last week. And last week we made our way through Luke 15, verses 1 through 10. And in those verses, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. We're in the final months of Jesus' ministry before he makes his way to Calvary. Now we're not certain where Jesus is located at this time, but we do know that a massive crowd is surrounding him. Inside that crowd are the religious Jews, the non-religious Jews who are considered the sinners. The tax collectors are part of that crowd, along with the Pharisees and the scribes. Now the Pharisees are sitting back, listening to what Jesus is saying, and they start to notice something. That Jesus is, is standing in the middle of the tax collectors and the sinners. This would have troubled the Pharisees greatly. Why is that? Because the Pharisees only associated with the religious elite. They didn't have time for the sinners. They didn't have time for the tax collectors. And here, this man, this God-man, that's who he's associating himself with. And they start to grumble to themselves. Look at this Jesus over there with the sinners and the tax collectors. See, this is what 
false religion does. It corrupts the truth. For the Pharisees have been teaching for generations that one is able to work their way into heaven by following the laws and commands of God. That salvation comes by way of works. That salvation comes by your bloodline. So again, they had no time to be around the tax collectors and the non-religious Jews, that being the sinners. But this is where Jesus smacks them right upside the head with two punishing parables. Let me go off just for a moment here, okay? Because you hear me say this time and time again. That we have sissified Jesus. But the more you read about him, the more he is constantly standing up to the false teachers, the most powerful men during that time in Jerusalem and the surrounding areas. And Jesus does not back down from them. How we allow Jesus to become sissified blows my mind. And yet here he is, once again, standing up to the powerful, the religious elite. And he starts out by telling a parable of a shepherd who's overseeing a hundred. But one of those sheep gets away, wanders off. And what does that shepherd do? He leaves the 99 and he goes after the one. Now this would have been A treacherous journey for the shepherd for two reasons. One, just to travel alone would have been tough and dangerous because he's having to look out for predators that would also be coming after that sheep. But also at the same time, he would be in severe trouble if he were to go back to the village that hired him to oversee their sheep and tell them that one had gotten away. But here the shepherd goes leaves the 99, takes off after the one. And he doesn't stop until he finds the one sheep. And what does he do? He picks it up, throws it over his neck, and carries the sheep back to his house, not to the pasture where the sheep ran from, no, back to his home. And he throws a party for that lost sheep. Now, when we break down the parable, who is the shepherd? It is Christ. Who is the sheep? The sinner. The very ones the Pharisees want nothing to do with. And that's who the shepherd went after. Who are the 99 sheep left behind? The Pharisees. The self-righteous who do not believe that they need a Savior because they follow the law perfectly. Which they can't. But that's what they believe. Now, we said this last week, too. In both of these parables, I want you to notice something. Notice something. The sheep never goes looking for the shepherd. For it is the shepherd who goes after the sheep. Remember that. And then Jesus goes into another parable. The lost coin. A woman loses a coin in her house, and she's a poor woman. And that coin was worth a day's wage. She needs to find that coin. So what does she do? She starts turning over couches, lifting up the refrigerator, looking behind the TV. She's sweeping everywhere, trying to find this coin, and then she finds it. And what does she do? She too throws a party. Now we broke down that parable. The woman is Christ. The coin is the sinner. Now he uses an inanimate object as the sinner. Why is that? Because that coin isn't looking for the woman. It's the woman who is going after the coin. They find it, she finds it, and what happens? That party is thrown. So here Jesus, these two parables are directed exactly the Pharisees 
Why is that? Because it's the sinner who needs to hear the good news. And when a sinner believes and repents, what happens? The heavens rejoice. That was the party in every scenario, those two parables. That's what you break it down. That's heaven rejoicing in the sinner being found. By who? By Christ. Now we don't know because we're not told this, but in this massive crowd of people, you would know the Jews would be kind of looking at each other, saying, uh, well, we never heard that before. And if you could just picture the Pharisees' face scrunched up, they're whispering to each other, who does this man think he is? But Jesus isn't done. He goes into the next parable. And we've heard this numerous times. Anybody that has been involved in church for a long period. The parable of the prodigal son. Do not, do not let the title fool you. For truly the main character in this story isn't the prodigal son. It's the older brother. So often, we don't hear about the older brother. So this is what I'm praying for. I'm praying by the time we finish, we understand why I'm saying this. Now remember the titles that were given in each of the the, the different paragraphs or the different verses that we go through. Those aren't inerrant. Those were added to it. So I'm not saying that God spoke the parable of the prodigal son is going to be the title, and here I am saying, well, this title isn't accurate. No, the the titles were added to the word. It kind of helps us know where to go. All right. Let's jump in. Look at verse 11. Again, picture it. Massive crowd full of the tax collectors, the sinners, the Jews, and the Pharisees. And they're all surrounding Jesus. He's already gone through Two parables, and he starts on the third. And he said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he, the father, divided his property between them. Now for many of us today, this, I think one of the biggest mistakes that the church makes is they try and make the Bible relevant to today's time. But that's not how you properly exegete Scripture. For the proper way for us to exegete the Word is to understand the culture during the time the Bible was penned. And during that time, for a son to ask his father for his inheritance before the father is dead is disgraceful. It is wicked. It is evil. It's like the son is saying, Dad, I wish you were already dead so I could have my inheritance. By the son demanding this, it shows the son has no respect for the father. It shows that he has no love for him either. What the son is actually saying is, I want nothing to do with this family. I want nothing to do with our faith. I want nothing to do with our culture. I just want out of here, far away from here. And I need my inheritance to do that. Now, a typical response from a Jewish father during that time would have been a slap across the face. Maybe two, maybe three, maybe just a beating would occur. The father may even go so far 
and disown the son. And the culture would have embraced that. But this father doesn't do that, does he? No. Instead, he does what the younger son asked for. And by this taking place, word would have gotten out into the town. Did you hear what he did? His son asked him for his inheritance and he gave it to him. Why in the world would he do that? The town, the village would have looked down upon the father and the sons. They'd be shaking their heads. I can't believe he did it. But notice we see nothing about the older son as of yet. Notice the older son isn't doing his job and stepping up and saying to his younger brother, what are you doing? The older brother should have been slapping the younger brother around. How dare you do this to our father? What is wrong with you? But nothing from the older son. The older son took the inheritance just as his younger brother did. Now for the Jewish people listening to this parable, for the Pharisees and the scribes, they would have been appalled by how this story begins. Just the beginning would be shocking to them. No way a father, no way a father would give his younger son the inheritance before he's dead. No Jewish man worth his salt would do such a thing. Now for the Pharisees, they would already be looking at each other saying, this is already going against the command of honoring your mother and father. Again, especially the The Pharisees, they would have been disgusted by this story so far. But listen, that's exactly what Jesus intended. Now look at verse 13. Jesus continuing with this story. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. So the son would have received the land that would have been his after his father died. But for him to actually make money off of that land, of course, he has to do what? He has to sell it. He needs the money for his travels. And when it says it only took a couple of days for this to take place, what did he do? He sold the land cheap. He wanted the money quickly. So he didn't wait for what the land was worth. It seems he took the very first offer. Now here's something else we have to understand about this time. The buyer would not receive the land right away. The buyer would actually have to wait until the father dies. And then he would receive the land. The buyer knew that. But it wasn't a big deal to him. Because he got such a great price. And think about what this son has just done. This land has been passed down from generation to generation, had been cared for for by the family for years upon years. And here this son sells it to the lowest bidder just so he could get away from his father, get away from his culture, and go and party like a rock star. That was his goal. So the younger son leaves Jerusalem and he heads into a Gentile land. That's what a far away country means. Again, this would have angered the Pharisees. No righteous Jew enters into the Gentile land. For the most part, what the Pharisees held to is if you had to cut through a Gentile land, it would be best to go around it. But if you have to cut through it, then before you enter back into the land of Jerusalem, you take the sandals and you knock the dust off of it so the Gentile land does not travel into the soil of Jerusalem. 
They despise the Gentiles. And yet, that's where the younger son ends up. Now again, nothing is said about the older brother. Which tells us what about him as well. For the older brother not to try and stop the younger brother, that means he, as well, does not respect the father. And there actually doesn't seem to be even a relationship between the two brothers. So the younger son takes the money, his inheritance, and blows it on prostitutes, parties, so-called friends who are only hanging out with him because of his money and his sinful lifestyle. But what happens? The money runs out. The party is over and he's all alone. Where are all the ones who were beside him when the party was rolling? Where are they now when the drinks were flowing and the women were plentiful? Where are they? They're gone. Now look at verse 14. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So not only is the younger son broke now in a Gentile land, a famine has fallen upon him. Now, oftentimes when a famine hit the land, people would be forced to move. But with no money, where can he go? So he's living in the land of Gentiles. No money and no food, no shelter. And he's living there during a time where people become desperate. So desperate that they would... Resort to cannibalism when the food runs out. So we're talking about someone who is in serious trouble. But notice what Jesus is doing. He is describing a man the Pharisees would claim is no longer redeemable. He is describing a man who the Pharisees would say, this man will never enter into the kingdom of God. He's got all the strikes against him. He's disgraced his father. He's moved to a Gentile land. He's spent all of his money on parties and prostitutes. So it's important for us to recognize the man that Jesus is describing and how the Pharisees would view that man. So now the younger son is facing something that he has never faced before. He's broke. Nowhere to turn. And why is that? Because of his sinful wants and desires. He's in a land that took everything he had. And yet, he's still wasn't ready to humble himself before his father. So he goes to plan B. Look at verse 15. So we went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. Jesus keeps piling on this man. So now, has he not only disgraced his father, spent all of his money on prostitutes and parties, living in a Gentile land, now he's feeding pigs. A Jew cannot be around a pig. They are considered unclean. And this is something that even in our culture today, we have a hard time grasping this part because oftentimes you read this and like, oh, so what? He's hanging out with pigs. No, Jews don't hang out with pigs. The Pharisees, according to their rabbinic law, considered any Jew associated with swine to be cursed. So there's no way this man can be saved according to the Pharisees. 
The original language helps us here in this verse. Because I think so often when we see where it states he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens, we think that a farmer actually hired him. But that's not the case. The prodigal son has leached on to this Gentile farmer. Because this farmer isn't paying him. No, he can't get rid of him. That's one of the reasons why the Gentile farmer tells the prodigal son, go feed the pigs. He knows he's a Jew. He knows that if he tells him to go feed the pigs, surely he's going to leave. But that isn't what happened. Again, Jesus is painting a picture of the prodigal son to be unredeemable. But he's also painting a picture of who we once were. In our fallen state, we too hated the Father. We too ran from the Father. We too wanted only our wants and sinful desires. At one time, we too were just like the prodigal son who did not want God. Now many sinners today want the attributes of God, such as grace, peace, mercy. They want the gifts that God has given them, life, family, friends, job, shelter. But they don't want God. They just want pieces of him. Now look at verse 16. Parable still continuing. Prodigal son. And he was longing to be fed with pods that the pigs ate and no one gave him anything. So remember, if he is actually working for this Gentile farmer, then the Gentile farmer would have been taking care of him in some way, shape, or form. But it says no one gave him anything. He's still hungry. He's not getting paid. He's craving to eat what the pigs eat. What kind of Jew is this? Not only is he feeding the pigs, but he's eating with them. He's craving the pods. Now listen, the the, the carob pod is a flowering evergreen or tree shrub in the legume family. And it is horrible. Some would rather die than eat the carob pod. That's where this man is. And if you can just picture him fighting the swine to eat something that most humans don't want. No one gave him anything. What's going on here? His sins have brought him to a place of brokenness. I mean, can you imagine looking around? You're sitting there with a bunch of pigs. You're fighting them for food. People are looking at you like, what's this guy doing? He's homeless, penniless. He's become a leech to a Gentile farmer just so he can share pods with pigs. There's nothing left. No money, no friends, no food, no shelter, nothing left, nowhere to turn except... Now look at the next verse. Verse 17. But when he came to himself, he said... How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? It's this moment that the prodigal son is hitting rock bottom. And when he hits rock bottom, what happens? He remembers his gracious father. And we're seeing here in this verse just how gracious the father is in this parable. The hired servants that he's speaking of are day laborers. They were poor. 
didn't have a trade, so they would work temporary odd jobs. And at the end of the day, they would be paid. But it wouldn't be much. But what is it that the son says about the father in this parable? That he made sure that the day laborers had more than enough. The day laborers served a gracious father. So the son realizes that if the day laborers aren't going hungry underneath his father, then surely he could return home and become one of them. No longer would he have to battle swine for food. The son thought, well, the worst that could happen is yes, I'll become a day laborer. I'm not accepted back into the household. I'm not going to have shelter. But at least I will have food. The son was hoping that he would receive the same graciousness his father gave to the day workers. So the son begins playing out this scenario in his head. I know none of you all do this. You're on your way somewhere and you're thinking of how the discussion is going to go and you start talking to yourself and you're having a conversation in your head back and forth. That's what the prodigal... Y'all don't do that? (laughs) Okay. Maybe my pills aren't working anymore. But anyway, (laughs) this is what what he does. Look Look at verse 18. I will arise... And go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. Again, this is what he's working out in his head. Again, the Pharisees would have had a serious issue with the part of the story. No self-respecting Jewish father would allow for a son to just return home. The Pharisees would expect in this parable that the good Jewish father would make his son wait outside of the gates. For days, maybe weeks, maybe even months. And as he's sitting there waiting, the father would eventually make his way to the gate, open it up, and tell his son to get off his property. That he's no longer his son. Or, the father would look at his son and say to him, You can come and work for me, but you're going to have to pay off your debt. For you to be my son again, for you to be welcomed back into this family, you're going to have to pay off the inheritance that you squandered. Now the Pharisees, hearing this parable, would have agreed that he should, the son should repent of his sins. But the only way the father, again, should forgive his son is the son must first work for it. That he would have to earn his way back into his father's good graces. That was the false theology that the Pharisees taught and followed. But with this conversation taking place in the son's head, and he's admitting that he had sinned against his father and the heavens, Notice what's happening. He's taking responsibility for his sins. We're seeing the human point of view of salvation. It is at this point where the Son comes to this realization that the Holy Spirit has regenerated his heart. Again, it's the Holy Spirit doing the work. But once that work is done, what is it that the Son is finally able to see? That he is the sinner who has rebelled against the Father. That he needs to repent of his sins. So you're seeing the human aspect of salvation by way of him coming to this understanding. And listen to me. Because I think this is where so many people kind of get tripped up when we talk about the Holy Spirit regenerating the heart. What many people will say is that Yes, but man can still deny the Holy Spirit once that happens. Man can still deny God once the Holy Spirit regenerates his heart. And I say, nope. Once the Holy Spirit regenerates the heart of man, the man then responds the way that he wants to 
And that is in a positive response to God. To believe and to repent. That, that's what we're seeing taking place with the prodigal son. Now look at verse 19. Him still talking to himself. I am no Lord worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. Mark that in your Bible. If you mark in your Bible, just mark the spot that says, treat me as one of your hired servants, because we're going to come back to this. Notice that the son's sins, the weight of those sins, have brought him to a simple understanding. Under the false teachings of the Pharisees, he would not be welcomed back as a son or even a servant, but hopefully a day laborer. That, that's underneath the, the Pharisees' false theology. The son has no hope underneath their system. It's a false system, but that's what he was raised in. He has no hope underneath that system. The son was willing to work for his father's forgiveness. That's what he had been raised to believe. However, his father had a measure of grace and mercy that he never expected. Now look at verse 20. All right, we're about to come in for a landing here, okay? Verse 20. And he arose. So, so finally the conversation in his head is over. He's making his way back home. Came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion, ran and embraced him and kissed him. Okay, at this point, the Pharisee is like, give me a break. Are you serious? This man who is disgraced by his son is watching out for his son? We know that's what he is doing. Day and night. He's waiting for his son to return. Why? Because it says he sees him from afar. But not only does he see him from afar, he doesn't tell one of his servants, hey, go and lock the gate. Don't let that punk in here. No, the father does something that no noble Jewish man during the ancient times did. He pulled up his robe and he took off running. The servants would have seen this. And they would have been shocked. No noble man would run during that time. The village would have saw the father sprinting down the driveway. The son from afar. And they're thinking, has he lost his ever loving mind? First he gives him his inheritance without being dead. He's been waiting day and night, watching out for his son. Then he sees him. He doesn't slap him upside the head. He doesn't tell him to get off his property. No, he runs and he embraces him and he kisses him. The crowd listening to that story would have let out aloud. <gasps> what? Instant forgiveness. Instant forgiveness. Before the son said a single word. Now you tell me. When it comes to the order of salvation. How does it work? Forgiveness. From God. Is first. Then repentance. Did you see that? I mean, if you truly think about it, the elect have already been forgiven before the foundation of the world. So the Holy Spirit must first work in the man or woman before they can repent and believe. Because again, notice the prodigal son hasn't said a single thing and yet the father has already embraced him and kissed him. Again, we have Jesus continuing to shatter the false teaching of the Pharisees. But this is what the scripture says.
this parable was destroying their false theology. He was going after what the the Pharisees taught, and that was this, that grace, mercy, and salvation are earned through works. And the son hasn't done a single thing except spit in his father's face. And we're seeing this parable unfold before our eyes. For just like the father who humbled himself by running and embracing and kissing his son, is that not what Christ did? Was it not Christ who left the glories of heaven to come to this fallen world as a servant? As a servant, Let me say that again. A humble servant at that. Full of grace and mercy. And did Christ not do the same as the Father? By embracing and receiving the sinners of this fallen world. And was it not Christ who did all the work on the cross to restore the sinner completely without any work of their own? For was it not Christ who did the work of living the perfect life? For was it not Christ who was charged as a criminal and put to death by being nailed to a tree as the perfect sacrifice. And for what? To pay the sin debt once and for all for those who believe in Him. Why? Because just like the prodigal son, fallen man can never repay their sin debt against God. Which is why every single human who has ever lived deserves the wrath of God. But just as the Father embraced the Son, said you're forgiven, that's exactly what Christ did for all of God's sons and daughters. We're going to stop right there and we'll pick up in verse 21 next week. Let us pray.